have to say that I first heard about this book when I was visiting Sue and, uh, and her family up in Vermont a few years ago. We go back a ways. We were in graduate school together. And so she, and I met Pransky, who is as cute as the cover photo, I just want to say, and is lovable and adorable. Uh, and Sue was sort of describing the work they were doing and talking about how she was going to write a book about this. And, you know, I thought, wow, that could be a really fun and interesting book. And I had no doubt in, that in her hands it would be. It would be entertaining. It would be fun. It would be interesting because she's a tremendous storyteller and such a great writer. I have to say I was a little unsure about how she was going to take it, though, to a deeper level. Like, how are you going to really take this whole story of your, you and your dog, Kransky, becoming a therapy team at the county nursing home? And how is that going to get beyond the sort of entertainment level of, of writing and for a reader? Um, and the thing is that this book, when I got the galley I read, and I got a galley pretty early because I know her editor, so she sent it to me. I could not put this book down. It is, it's such a deep book. It's so provocative. Uh, it takes us on Sue and Pransky's journey into this, into this home where, near where they live in Vermont. And it's a very difficult landscape of people who are aging and infirm. And it's, it's in that landscape that Pransky becomes Sue's teacher and guides her into the discovery of really her own deeper humanity and the deeper humanity that exists around all of us, um, even when we're sometimes unaware of it and in very unlikely and unexpected places. Um, I don't want to say too much because I know she'll talk about it. I do want to say one thing about Pransky. So I know Sue pretty well. Obviously, I've only met Pransky once, so I did a little research on Pransky. And, uh, you know, if you read the book, you will know from Sue that Pransky is, you know, the world's greatest dog, among other things, the most intelligent dog. But if you don't want to trust me or Sue on this point, um, and you, you know, kind of do a little bit of uh, internet research, you'll find that uh, Pransky actually um, gives interviews. And Pransky has been asked about her relationship to Sue and how it changed in the course of, of, of this, this uh, nursing home experience. And um, basically what she said was, well, they were very close to begin with, a very loving, bonded relationship. But through the course of working in this you know, difficult situation for several years, um, they now actually end each other's sentences. Um, and while, you know, you know how authors and protagonists of stories are always asked, you know, what do you do in your spare time? What do you do for fun? So uh, when not working, Pransky enjoys chasing small rodents, cross-country skiing, and sleeping. So. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, Pransky can't be here tonight, but she will get a, a full download, I'm sure, of the event. Um, and we're so sorry she's not here, but we are really, really delighted. And I'm, I just want to say I'm really personally delighted. I, you know, Sue's a great, she's a great person beyond how talented she is. And... Um, I'm really, I really am just happy to have her here at Politics and Prose and have all of you here to uh, enjoy this event. So please join me in welcoming Sue Halpern. Well, I think I need to go back to Vermont now because nothing I do will actually compare to that. But thank you so much, Lisa and to Brad. Um, so um, as, as Lisa said, she got the book pretty early. In fact, she was the first person who wasn't basically related to me in some way to read the book. And um, I, I actually, I don't think I knew that she had the book, um, which was probably for the best. And um, so she got the book and then I heard from her and she really liked it. And I thought, okay, well, she doesn't actually have to say she liked it. So it was just this one moment, you know, in the neurotic life of a writer um, where I felt like, okay, maybe, maybe this is going to work. Um, so the book just came out a few days ago. Um, and there was an official launch um, in, in my town of Middlebury, um, sponsored by the nursing home. Um, but in fact, um, I, I like to say that the book was launched about a year ago when we did, uh, Pransky and I did a, a benefit for the Humane Society in um, Lake Placid, New York. And um, it was a big stage, a couple hundred people. I'm on the stage, I brought my dog, my very well-behaved dog, She's sitting right there next to me, and I'm extolling her virtues. And um, all of a sudden, the door in the back opens, and my dog catapults herself off the stage. And she's now like about three feet or four feet in the air. Um, she lands at like row 20, and then she's like in the back all the way. And I'm like, I'm thinking, you know, it's definitely breaking my concentration. I'm thinking, what is going on? And I finally noticed that there is a an actual service dog in the house. A, a, a blind woman has arrived with her seeing eye dog, and my dog has gone to investigate. And so, um, thus, she has launched this book um, that way with herself. 
Um, so one of the problems with that was I was, um, you know, about to read the section where I talk about how I taught her how to come when she was called, um, which was completely contradicted by this <laughs> event, and I had to skip that part and go to the part where she was very ill-behaved. Um, anyhow, one of the one of the things I've noticed people ask me a lot um, is how do you know if your dog would make a good therapy dog? Um, and, and what I usually say, or what I used to say, was like, you will know. You will know if your dog would make a good therapy dog. Um, and, you know, the temperament has to be the right temperament. They have to be calm. They have to be intelligent. Um, they have to be a good learner. They have to be social. They have to be obedient. Um, and the dog also has to be a good listener. Um, so you'll just know intuitively. Um, you've seen the dog interact with little kids, with older people, with anybody, really. Um, you'll know if your dog is a, you know, trash dog. You'll know if your dog is a scavenger or a foodie. Um, and um, you'll also know, in another way, you'll know if your dog isn't a good therapy dog. You just know these things intuitively. And um, I know this for a fact because we had a dog before we had the uh, wonderful dog, Pransky, um, and her name was Cuffy. She also came, both of my dogs came from this basic neighborhood. Um, this dog, Cuffy, was um, also a Labradoodle, and she was a Labradoodle with a death wish. Um, I, I, you laugh, but it is true. Um, and I can prove it. Uh, well, actually, our vet bill can prove it. But um, we had a friend, Gary, who was highly allergic. Um, he was allergic to dogs, and even though this was a, a Labradoodle, he had brought a lot of Claritin with him to visit us, it was in his knapsack, and this dog managed to go into the knapsack, find the Claritin, undo the child-proof cap, and take all of the Claritin, and end up in the uh, emergency vet hospital where she had ended up numerous times before, um, and eventually she died. Um, so um, this dog, that dog, would not have made a good therapy dog. Um, um, and so... What we learned from that was that um, if idle paws are the devil's playthings, we did not want Pransky to have idle paws. Um, and so I started looking at her, trying to figure out if she needed an early intervention. Um, but then she was a very self-aware dog, and uh, she started asking for one. So um, I thought I would read a tiny bit um, about this, about her needing to, uh, to do something so she wouldn't become a bad dog. Um, and it'll give you a, sort of a sense of, of this book. Um, Pranny was bored. She'd pretend sleep, eyes closed, ears open, listening for any sound of an activity that might include her. I'd stand up from my desk, and she'd jump up from wherever she was in the house and report at the ready by my side. Too bad we were only going downstairs to fold the laundry. It was pretty clear to me that she needed a job. But what? We didn't have sheep, so she couldn't be a herding dog. We didn't hunt even though she did at times, trotting home with a still warm bunny or squirrel. She could, though, I reasoned, go back to her roots and become a service dog. The original Labradoodle was a seeing-eye dog. Pransky, at six, was too old for that, and anyhow, I wasn't willing to give her over to someone else. There are all sorts of service dogs, search-and-rescue dogs, cancer-sniffing dogs, paratrooper dogs, mobility dogs, seizure-alert dogs, hearing dogs, but most of these are full-time occupations not suitable for a family pet. Even so, I read all the descriptions like an unemployed person reading the classifieds. Pranny, I'd ask my reclining canine stretched out on the couch. Would you like to be a bomb sniffer dog? She thumped her tail. Pranny, do you want to be a Navy SEAL dog and jump out of airplanes? More thumps. Are you sure? You have to eat MREs. Extra thumps. Eat was one of her words. The therapy dog description was different. It was like reading a classified that had our names on it that said, wanted, irresistibly cute blonde dog with a black olive nose and distinctive eyebrows who is friendly to all, kind, enthusiastic, well-behaved, smart, and willing to spend time with people who could use some love and affection. Jumpers and barkers need not apply. Must have a loyal human partner who need not be anywhere near as attractive. It was perfect. <laughs> we were there. <laughs> Gita is now saying that she wants also to be a therapy dog. Um, 
So last week, um, I did a series of interviews on a blog that is run by um, Andrew Sullivan, this blog called The Dish, and he has this thing where it's like, ask me anything. And I was the therapy doc person. There's honey. Honey has arrived. Honey is in the house. Um, so he wanted to know, um, so one of the questions that, that they asked me there and that uh, people seem to want to know is, um, what's the most surprising thing that we found at their nursing home? Um, and I think that when people ask that question, they already have a set of preconceived ideas about what a nursing home is. Um, and those ideas are often very grim. Um, I mean, I shared them. When I um, first wanted to go work at the nursing home, I actually tried to worm my way into the dementia unit as opposed to the general population because I had this idea that um, the people in the dementia unit were ambulatory. They didn't look sick. They had a, you know, a terrible disease, but they actually looked pretty good. Um, whereas the people in the general population were sort of those people that you imagine in nursing homes, and that scared me. Um, so I, I kind of understand, you know, where that question is coming from. Um, and my answer to that, and it was surprising not just to me then, but it continues really to surprise me, is that um, what was the most surprising thing was how much fun it is and was to go there. It's really fun. Um, and that seems weird. Like, who thinks of nursing homes as fun places, except for now me? Um, you know, one of the things that's really true about nursing homes is that they're filled with old people. Um, and the other thing that's true about nursing homes is that they are filled with nurses. Um, and one of the tasks of the nurses is to make sure that the old people in the nursing home are comfortable and also that they're safe. So these are like, they're attempting to make them kind of risk-free environments um, because the alternative is kind of scary. And um, so you want to, you know, keep the, the tension there down. Um, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of institutions are kind of slow to adopt pet therapy. I mean, in the beginning, um, hospitals and nursing homes and hospices didn't want dogs because the assumption was that they were going to be vectors of disease. They were going to bring in you know, germs. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's changing. Um, one of the questions that people ask me is, you know, well, is this really therapy? And my answer to that is, you know, historically, when you think about medicine, the, the first thing you think about medicine is before there's, you know, Western medicine, there's the laying on of hands. And that's really what this is. This is the laying on of hands. Um, and it is definitely therapy. But anyhow, you're in this risk-free environment that, you know, is intended to be risk-free. And then all of a sudden you, you, you enter, enter a dog. And it can be the most well-behaved dog on the planet. But it's, it's a little bit like... Um, Watching the, the figure skaters in the Olympics, you know, they are very well trained. But every time they go up to do the triple Lutz, you know, you're waiting for something to happen that might not be what they expect. And it's a little bit the same with the dog. The dog comes in there and the opportunity for the dog to do something goofy um, or silly or bad um, is always there. And everyone knows it. And it kind of makes the place more exciting. Um, just this notion of risk makes it more exciting for everyone there. Um, one time we were in the nursing home, and it was the uh, monthly Methodist service, but it was Easter. And all the people were in this one activities room, and they were, like, packed. You know, all their wheelchairs were all packed in. And, um, and we were walking by, and the music was going, and it was really nice. And always when there's the, the church service, we always go in because, you know, everyone likes the dog, and they're all there, so... And the minister likes the dog. Um, what I did not know was that this time the minister had brought a lamb on a leash. Um, so, so like, and I, because I always do, I always drop the leash when Franny goes into the activities room. So I drop the leash, and all of a sudden there was this like mad scramble, and so I saw my dog like going in between the wheelchairs, and the people are like going ah. And I was like thinking, you know, I had no idea what was going on. And all of a sudden I heard, uh, <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. And the minister was just appalled. I mean, it was just, it was a nightmare. But it was so funny. And everyone in this room, everyone was just cracking up. And it was so great. And it was probably the best part of that, um, that Easter service. Uh, so anyhow, um, so 
my point about nursing homes is that we have these fixed ideas about them, and they, I think they're probably often very wrong. Um, and one reason I think that they're probably wrong is because, and this is something we learned, is something my dog taught me, um, is that we tend at a certain point in our life to stop looking at people as people, um, and we see them as a collection of what's wrong, you know, a collection of their disabilities. So, you know, I might go into the nursing home and there's a guy who's missing his legs, and I might think of him as the guy with no legs, as opposed to the guy who was a trucker or the guy who was a lawyer or whatever he was. And, you know, we forget that people have had families and they've had histories and that they are people. And I think that's one of the great lessons that I got from going with a dog who could care less about what's wrong with someone. She only cares that they are our people. Um, so um, I'm just going to read a little bit on this one section um, about not taking people for granted. And it's um, there's a character in this section who in the book I call Clyde. Um, and I should tell you a little bit about him. Um, Clyde was the largest flirt on the planet. He was about 88. Um, and he was had no teeth. Um, he wore really big, weird glasses. Um, he was not really that attractive, but he thought he was incredibly attractive. And it just, it, it was like his aura. His aura was, he was, he was, he was a player. Um, <laughs> you know, I would walk my dog and um, by him, and he would, he would say things like, come closer, come closer. And I would, in the beginning, I thought he was just wanting to look at my dog. And then I was like, he's looking down my shirt. Like, <laughs> come on. So after a while, you know, I sort of got used to Clyde, and I kind of kept my distance a little bit. And he completely changed his affections. He, he, he moved them from me to the dog. Um, and he just, he had a thing for the dog. And one time he was... Um, he wanted, he, you know, he wanted to have a special relationship with my dog, and so he he got one of those um, those sugar wafer crackers, the kind that are pink, and then they have that kind of mortar in the middle, and then they're pink on the other side. And he wanted to give this to my dog. And that you don't, you know, it's not a good idea to give like sh pure sugar to a dog. Um, so I, and I didn't realize this was happening. I was sort of, you know, keeping my, my distance while the dog was was conversing with Clyde. And all of a sudden, I see him with this big pink thing going towards the dog, and I like jump in and I intervene and I like grab it and he's like I'm giving the dog a treat you know what's the what's your problem and I and I'm thinking what's my problem and I say oh um that's not good for her it it, it will ruin her girlish figure and he was like oh <laughs> we wouldn't want that to happen <laughs> so <laughs> so it was Clyde and um he had this incredible, this was either an incredibly rich fantasy life or this was true, and I never could figure it out, but he was convinced that his nephew was going to arrive any day in a red Mustang that was his. I don't know how, because he'd been in the nursing home for 13 years, but it was his. And by the way, he, he explained to me that he had had many affairs with the nurses. Um, so who knows? Um, anyhow, they were gonna, he was going to arrive in this red Mustang and they were going to go to Florida. This guy was going to liberate him. It was like a great buddy movie, you know, starting in a nursing home and going on, on the road. Um, and um, needless to say, this never happened. Um, anyhow, he was a great guy and very, very funny. And I thought I would just read a, a little section about how you don't uh, you try not to um, be too judgmental in, in advance. But I can't say that I follow this myself. There's a whole branch of spirituality that trades in angels and miracles, and what I witnessed at County, sometimes because of the dog, and sometimes simply because the dog had brought me there, was not like that at all. There were no burning bushes or parting seas the mo morning Thomas spoke. There was only his voice and his words, and the active mind, I assumed, did not exist. The miracle wasn't his. He'd been able to speak all along. It was mine. Call it the miracle of enlightenment or better still, call it the miracle of waking up to not writing people off. For weeks when Pransky and I visited Thomas, our encounters always went the same way. Thomas, dressed in a stained polo shirt and sweats, would be sitting in the day room looking at the TV. The dog and I would approach. Thomas would reach out with his left hand and with fingers calloused from a life of milking cows and mending fences, zero in on a spot on Pransky's back and move those fingers methodically in and out like he was clenching and releasing his fist. It was a simple transaction, but one that appeared to bring both parties great pleasure. 
Thomas said nothing. I said nothing. Sometimes Pranny would sigh. After about five minutes, Thomas would withdraw his hand and we'd move on. She likes that, Thomas said one morning, unbidden. I was shocked. You can speak, I wanted to exclaim, and had to stop myself from saying that or something equally inappropriate. She does, I said enthusiastically. She got a haircut, he said, which amazed me. Not only could he speak, he'd been paying attention. So what are you watching, I asked. On the screen was a tanned, buff, pleasantly handsome man in crisp blue scrubs sitting on a stool on a stage looking out at a studio audience. He was the quintessence of the television medicine man. Clyde, who had rolled up next to Thomas, was watching too. Doctors talking, Thomas said, about health things. It seemed a bit Coles to Newcastle busman's holiday-ish to me that a couple of guys who were endlessly prodded and poked by people in scrubs would want to spend their free time listening to the white coats talk about kidneys and prostates, but both men were giving the screen their undivided attention. Was it that the fellow on TV was an actual physician, while the people who worked at county were mainly nurses' aides and LPNs and RNs, so that seeing a real live doctor was an event? This was, after all, a nursing home, which is to say that most of the people who worked there were nurses. So what's this show about, I asked after the commercial break, when the handsome male doctor, think plastic surgeon, was joined on stage by a gorgeous female doctor, think dermatologist, and yes, think not fair, these are stereotypes, which is to say I was expecting the answer to be calf implants or a varicose vein reduction. This was, after all, daytime TV. It's taboo, Thomas said. And before I had a chance to consider all the dimensions of this unlikely response, Clyde said, sex. Clyde was looking right at me when he said the word, like he was trying to see if I would blink. Or, Clyde being Clyde, maybe this was his idea of a pickup line. What about sex? I asked innocently. Contraception, Thomas said. Boring, Clyde said, blah, 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 and unlocked the brakes on his wheelchair and spun himself down the hall towards the activities room, where a bunch of residents and volunteers were busy making corn husk dolls. He liked to be where the ladies were. And of course, given the demographics of aging, he was. He lived in a nursing home where most of the people were women. Um, when I um, started working at the nursing home, uh, I was doing it really because I, I wanted something to do with my dog um, because we weren't bonded enough. Um, but while I was there, because I'm a writer, I was sort of thinking, well, what's the story here? Like, what's going on? Is there a story here? Is there a kind of a through line? What, what am I, you know, what are we getting? And um, I had read um, Tuesdays with Maury about, you know, the, the old professor with ALS who had you know, great wisdom to impart to people. And I, I thought, you know, this is weird. We're here on Tuesdays. Maybe I could write Tuesdays with Pransky. And it would be an incredible bestseller. And we would go on to write other great bestsellers about, you know, spiritual enlightenment through dogs. And, you know, that would be that. Um, but I actually realized um, while uh, having these fantasies of uh, that, that there wasn't that kind of wisdom coming through from, from the residents exactly. Um, there was a lot of things that we were learning. Um, and there are a lot of things that I personally was learning, and I was learning them often from the dog, um, which sounds weird, except for the people here with their dogs. Um, but, you know, she was able to kind of bring out more humanity um, in me and in the people that she was visiting um, than one might um, ordinarily expect. Um, so there was a lot of wisdom to come out of this experience, but it was coming sort of through a different kind of door. Um, and so, um, I'm going to read one more part and then I'm going to stop and you can ask questions, um, about how great my dog is. And I'm going to be really happy to explain that over and over again. Um, but let me, let me just, I'm going to sort of read really the end of the end of the book, um, which is actually the introduction to the book because you write your introduction after you've actually written the book. And, um, and when I was writing this introduction, I was sort of thinking, well, what's, what's this, you know, what's the point of this book? And um, so I'm just going to read that and leave it at that. Um, and I think you'll get a sense of, of what, this, what this book is. And Lissa pointed out that it wasn't sort of just a book about a dog. Pransky, my soon-to-be 10-year-old dog, is lying on the living room couch, her body filling it end to end. For though she's not a big dog, she's double-jointed, which means that her hips lay out flat. 
It's a Tuesday afternoon, and if I weren't typing this, I'd be stretched out next to her because I'm tired too, as I often am after spending time at the county nursing home where we work as a therapy dog team. Even though what we do there is nothing more than going door to door, dispensing canine companionship and good cheer. After three years, you think we would have gotten tougher or more resilient, but it's never happened and probably never will. Working at the nursing home requires us to pay attention. Kransky to me, to her surroundings, and to the people she is meeting, and me to her, to our surroundings, and the people we are meeting. Every other day of the week, Kransky is a carefree country dog who operates by instinct, roaming the meadows of our house. When I first considered training Pransky to be a therapy dog, she was in her late adolescence. Dog ears being what they are, she is now about the same age as most of the people in the nursing home. Even so, the words work and walk still get her to her feet in a unit of time that is less than seconds. Is she better at her job, more empathetic, now that she too is of a certain age? I doubt it. I doubt it because I don't think she could be more empathetic. As far as the nursing home environment was to us both when we first started visiting, it was a little less so to me since my first job at, was at a medical school in a teaching hospital where I sometimes went on rounds. I was in my late 20s with a newly minted doctorate hired to teach ethics to second year medical students. This should tell you all you need to know about how seriously that place took the ethical part of medical education. At that age, I had about as much experience with the complicated ethical dilemmas of sick people and their families as the second years in my class had treating sick people and dealing with those ethical dilemmas, which is to say, basically, none. Still, reality was not our mandate. We were supposed to consider what might, ha what might happen if, and then think through the best then. The one thing you need to know about modern philosophy is that the operative word in the previous sentence is best. The first thing we had to do in that class was figure out what it meant. Was it what the person in the bed said she wanted? What the doctor wanted? What the hospital risk manager wanted? What the church wanted? What the husband wanted? What the other doctor wanted? What the wife wanted? What the parents wanted? What the children wanted? Sorting out what was best was, to say the least, challenging. For guidance, we read works by Kant and Aristotle and Bentham, among others, that were harder to get through than the textbooks on human anatomy and organic chemistry for my students who were itching to get into the clinic. While I didn't think for a minute that an abstract principle like Kant's categorical imperative was actually going to lead to the right decision whether or not, for example, to give a new heart to a homeless man, it seemed like a reasonable idea in a place where right answers were often not as black and white as they might appear to inject some of these notions into the future doctor's heads. If ideas like these could become part of a doctor's mental landscape, then when confronted with that homeless man in the future, she or he would see the terrain ahead with more definition. When Pransky and I started working at Porter, I expected to learn things. How could I not? Though what those things would be, I had no clue. I assumed I'd learned something about old people and about the therapeutic values of value of animals in a medical setting and about myself in that setting, which was alien and not a little scary. What I found myself learning about quickly sorted itself into a template that anyone with a Catholic education, especially, which would not include me, would recognize as the seven virtues, love, hope, faith, prudence, and so on. The Catholics didn't have a corner on virtue. Um, they just happened to enumerate them. The Greeks, of course, started it, and most religions, in addition to Christianity, have their own variants of behaviors and practices that might lead to sanctity or harmony or happiness of all of the above. Happiness, as it happened, was the domin dominant emotion for both Pransky and me when we were at the nursing home, strange as that sounds and strange as it was. I didn't go there to be happy any more than I did to learn about hope or fortitude or think about courage or faith, but that's what happened. You could say I was lucky, and in fact, by landing at county, I was lucky. County happens to be blessed with tremendous leadership, a devoted staff, and a larger community that brace, embraces it rather than isolates it. I wouldn't presume that it is comparable to any other nursing home. But I do believe in settings like nursing homes and in hospitals and hospices and any other place where life is in the balance, we get to the essentials, which is what the virtues are. More than luck was at work, too. My dog was at work, and she brought a lightness and easiness that seemed to expand outward and encompass almost everyone she encountered. We often talk about getting out of our comfort zone, but rarely encountering someone's else, entering someone's else. Kransky made that possible. With her by my side and sometimes in the lead, I was able to be a better, more responsive, less reticent version of myself. One day, a man I didn't know was sitting idly by himself in the nursing home hall. He was wearing a badly tied hospital gown that exposed part of his back and nothing else. 
It was rare for people at county not to be dressed in street clothes, so that would have caught my attention, but that's not what, did, what did. The man was jaundiced and almost as yellow as a liquid running through the tube that started under his hospital gown and ended a bag at the side of his wheelchair. That, and he had no legs. If I had been alone, I might have nodded in his direction and kept going because that man represented most of the things that scared me about nursing homes. Debilitating illness, a lack of privacy, bodily fluids. But I was not alone, and my partner veered in his direction, which meant that I had no choice but to go over and talk to him. What a nice guy. We talked about dogs. He had two Yorkies at home. We talked about sports. He was a Steelers fan. We talked dogs some more. I was in his comfort zone, and Pransky's, and then mine. It was in the scheme of things a small thing, but small things add up. So I'm going to end there and hope that you'll ask some questions. My question is more beginning part. I'm actually a retired physical therapist, so I have a little bit of the latter part. Um, what did you do in training your dog? Okay. Did you do formal training? Did you? So the, so the question is about training, and... Um, I did not do formal training. I, I chose, there are different organizations that will certify a dog. Um, and um, I chose one called Therapy Dogs International because I had this sudden vision that we could go anywhere in the world, my dog and I. So, so I chose like, to go there with that, that one. And they also, the other reason I chose it is because they don't require you to go to classes. But they do require you to pass this test, which is really hard. The, the, when we went to take the test, um, we were walking uh, in the area, it was t Tess was outside, we were walking there, and there's this woman with like a chalk bag on her hip. She's walking with her dog, and she's like giving the dog like all these treats. And like I'm thinking, oh, there's someone we can talk to. And so we start approaching her. It's like, don't come anywhere near me. We're, 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 we're preparing for the test. We failed three times already. And I was like, oh, my God. So, um, so basically what I did was I looked at those 15 things that we had to do. I sort of understood what my dog already knew how to do and what she did not know how to do, and we focused on the stuff she didn't know how to do. And I did this for about three or four months. Um, it was kind of excruciating. Um, and then I watched a couple of YouTube videos of people going through the test. So we sort of, you know, it was like our cliff notes. Um, and then we cheated, um, which I write about in the book. Um, hands down, we cheated, but I, I've come clean. It's, it's all there. It's, it's, this book is really an expose. Um, <laughs> If you read the interview with Pransky, as uh, Lisa was re reading from it, but if you read the whole uh, interview with Pransky, which is on my website, um, and published, so it's like, I didn't just write it. I mean, this is a real interview with my dog. And um, the dog points out, when, when confronted that she might have cheated, she points out that she did not cheat. She personally did not cheat. She kind of puts it on me. Um, so anyhow, you, all you have to do is... I saw, those, I saw the 15 things, and they did look a little challenging. It's very challenging. So, it is really challenging. But I'll, I'll have um, to look at the YouTube. The, the, thing, that was, the thing that was sort of interesting was, like, I knew that there were certain things that my dog wasn't going to be good at, but I also knew she would be a great therapy dog. And so um, it was kind of annoying. And I actually tried to game the system and get into the nursing home without passing the test. And I called them up, and I was like, you know, I have this dog, and she's really cute, and she's really nice, can we come? And I thought, well, we'll work with d dementia patients, no one's going to want to work with those people. And, you know, I kept on going, and the, and, the, and the person I was talking to was like, you know, we really like cute dogs. And I was like, great, we're there. And she said, and it's great that you want to work with people who have dementia. And then I was like, great, we're really there, we're never going to have to take this test. And then she said, um, but we have so many people who want to work with those people. And... Um, um, and, and as soon as you get your therapy dog certification, we, we really like cute dogs and you can come. So I had no choice but to cheat right away. Um, did, you have any, journalist. did you have any moments where you thought to yourself, wait, this is, this is crazy. Like, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Um, and, and like, what did, what like helped you through? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't feel like, I mean, I'll tell you, there were, there have been some times where, you know, the thing you think about a nursing home, you think a lot of people are going to die. You know, like they're there, they're going to drop dead any minute. And it um, turns out not to be true. Um, they're there often for the long haul. And, you know, it's a rare week when someone dies. Um, but sometimes people are actively dying. And the first time um, we were invited, and in fact requested, that, to go into the room of someone who was actively dying, um, and I went in there with the dog, and it was really hard. 
it was really tough. Not for me, not for the dog. She was amazing, but it was really hard for me. And it was, I was pretty shaky. Um, but again, I sort of followed, you know, I, first of all, I wasn't about to leave. Like I wasn't going to run out of the room. That would have been really bad. Um, and I just watched the dog. I watched what she could do as a woman who had had a terrible stroke and was sort of seizing over and over and over again. And she was moving her body was like slamming and slamming and just, and, and the dog got, was asked to get into bed with her. Um, and the dog got in bed with her and she lay down sort of her whole length. So her whole body was, was sort of parallel to this woman who was moving and moving and moving and crashing into the dog and crashing into the dog and crashing into the dog who didn't move. And I was just like, what is going to happen here? And all of a sudden, the, one of the family members took the, their mother's arm and put it around the dog and said, Mom, the dog is here. And Mom stopped for a moment and opened her eyes for a second. And it was just like, oh, my God, like, what just happened? And it was, it was just so stunning. So my instinct would have been, like, I did not want to go in that room, and I didn't really want to stay in that room, and yet staying in that room was really kind of magical. Um, I was just going to ask, because people always say that, that our dogs are, as you said, our pet training was bored. And so did you notice, and, uh, and you talked about what you learned, but did you notice that she seemed more fulfilled when she had a job. <laughs> and do these dogs, do our dogs need more to do? Uh, um, I, I do think they need more to do. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I, I don't really know that they need more to do, but I always know that, you know, if you're going to take your dog for a walk, the dog gets really excited. There's a reason for that. You know, any activity that you're going to do with your dog, your dog tends to get really excited because otherwise they're just like layabouts. And, you know, they're like on the dole. I don't think they want to be on the dole. Um, but I've noticed with Pransky that um, her affect changes when we, as soon as we, you know, as soon as I say, you know, it's a work day, we're going to work, we're going to, you know, I, she gets dressed for work. I mean, that sounds kind of crazy, but there's just, there's this kind of ritualistic behavior that happens. Um, and her, you know, her body kind of uh, changes, her body language changes. She gets really excited. Um, and then when we get to the nursing home, we ha I have this kind of ritualistic little chat I have with her before we go through the door. And once we're there, she her, her whole attitude is one of literally, she's constantly paying attention. She is always looking at me, and I am always talking to her. And she there is just not a moment in which we're sort of not in this kind of thing together. And I think that's, like, it's, the reason why I think it, it, I know that it changes for her is because when we leave, she climbs into the car and she falls asleep. She just, it's like she can't pay attention any more than that. And, but I think it's really good for her. And, and as you know, because you know her, you know, she's a really smart dog and she learns really, really fast. And um, the book I wrote before this book was about, about memory and about the brain. And there's this whole thing about, you know, neuroplasticity. Like, like as you learn, your brain changes. It's got to be true for dogs, too. So, you know, that whole thing about, like, you can't teach a dog, an old dog new tricks, that absolutely cannot be true. And so, you know, it's really good to keep, you know, stimulating your dog as they um, get older and 